Good evening, and welcome to I'm Listening, Stay Connected. We've got a great show planned for you. We have comedian Margaret Cho and our medical expert, Dr. Jen Wider. I'm Listening is a 24-7, 365 initiative that works to destigmatize discussing mental health. Now, we are all going through what we call a collective trauma, which means we're going to have a lot of collective grief. People are suffering from all different kinds of emotional experiences that seem kind of foreign to them. And so I'm talking a lot about individuals giving themselves a little more care and compassion around their emotional experience because we're encountering something that is a little, you know, a little bigger than what we have the internal capacity to deal with. So we have to give ourselves a little bit of a break. We're going to be feeling more sadness, more fear, more anxiety. And I want to remind everyone that it's important now more than ever that you let yourself feel. Whatever you're feeling, now is not the time to get hung up on grieving the right way, expressing your emotionality in the way that you're most familiar, and again, being present to what you're feeling, but more importantly, expressing it and sharing it with those around you. Because that's how we help ourselves really process and digest, but also give those around us permission. Because again, I keep using the word collective because we're all in this together and we're all going to start to encounter and experience things that are a little foreign to us. Now, part of going through that collective grief is going to be allowing some new coping mechanisms. Again, that's going to mean having more time spent maybe playing video games, watching movies, eating food you're not most comfortable with, give ourselves a break. It's that care and compassion word where you're going to have to have a new experience of your body as it changes and it shifts, a new experience of how you use your time. And, I, and I'm telling the people I'm working with clinically, if you want to spend a couple more hours playing those video games, do so. If you want to sleep in a little bit longer, do so. Go easy on yourself, but to let yourself involve and engage in all these new coping mechanisms because that's how we're going to get through this. I'm being very thoughtful because I want us to come out of this no worse off than we entered it. So it's all about feeling our feelings, but again, adding that level of care and compassion. Now, we also have to take a relational approach. So now is not the time to be making any major life transitions. Now is not the time to be making decisions about the future of your marriage, the future of your career, or relocating. Now's the time to be putting those kinds of major decisions aside because we're in our emotions. And a lot of what you might be doing with your decision making might be rooted more in just reactivity or again, that grief that we're all feeling. So don't don't get into things that are highly conflictual. We learn about our triggers with the, those around us and our own triggers. Stay away from those. So again, stepping aside from anything that doesn't need to be dealt with right now. You can write it down. You can come back to it. We're not ignoring it or sweeping it under the rug. But while we're at home self-isolating, not feeling at our best, again, now is not the time to be making major life transitions. So you have to support those around you in doing the same. Boundaries are going to be an important part of our self-care right now. Now, though, we are going to be joined by comedian Margaret Cho. Margaret, welcome to I'm Listening. Stay connected. Thank you so much. That's very good advice. And I'm glad to uh, be talking with you now. It's very lonely here. Yeah. And that's kind of what I want to jump in and talk about. I'm asking everyone as they join us on the show. First off, how is your mental health right now? It's pretty good. It's definitely different. I, I think that... Um, Part of what I do in life is travel, and that's a major part of my personality. I've always been um, somebody who's on the road, and to be grounded in this way is very strange. And so I, uh, I have been trying to take care of myself. I have a wonderful dog here who's sleeping. She is really, really important. I think animals have been a big help for everybody this time. And I also have um, my instruments, my piano and my guitars and my accordion and my melodica and all the weird instruments I'm learning how to play because I have time. Um, I'm watching movies like Eyes of Laura Mars, which I just watched today, wow. which I love. And so, um, you know, I'm grateful that we have streaming services and, and uh all kinds of ways to connect with other people. I'm doing a lot of um, talking on the phone uh, and FaceTiming, and um, that, that's that been very helpful too. Yeah, and that's powerful. You started by saying the loneliness. I, I like yourself, my job as a therapist is a lot of face-to-face. -face. I'm not home often, so I'm kind of feeling some of that loneliness as well. So our, our governor, Gavin Newsom, was talking about talking to at least five people every day 
Um, how are you managing the amount of socialization that you're trying to have? Are you reaching out when lonely? Are you trying to be preventative? Yes, I'm definitely reaching out. Uh, and what's fortunate is that I do have somebody who is in this quarantine with me, but we're not living together, but we've been spending time together um, since that's the only person I've seen, but it breaks it up a little bit. But most of the time I'm on my own. Um, and, uh, you know, of course it's, it, it's certainly something I'm very conscious of and I'm very, very aware of the distancing. So I'm trying to not interact outside at all. And I'm trying not to, um, go to the supermarket and stuff like that. I, I, I really am trying to kind of just stay and shelter in place. And, um, but I am speaking to lots of different people all day long. Um, I don't even wait until I get lonely. I kind of just reach out just to see if they're okay. And that's a nice thing to do. Yeah, it's a it's a it's an interesting moment because as human beings, we literally require eye contact and touch. And so we're having to kind of go up against our natural impulses, even if you're kind of introverted. And so I applaud you for following the rules and staying in because apparently we haven't even reached the peak of the COVID infections right now. Yeah, and I really am so aware of that. And it really gives me anxiety when I uh, look at the news and see people not following any of these guidelines who are having parties and at the beach. And it's, it's really scary uh, that you, you're not taking this seriously. This is a, and the pe more people who don't take this seriously, the longer it will go on. And, and so I, I'm really, I'm really trying to make sure that I don't get it, that I don't pass it along to anyone. I'm very also kind of a hypochondriac. So that, that is also another part of like having to manage that anxiety too. So it's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. So other than becoming a one woman band with all those instruments that you play, um, are there any other aspects of yourself emerging that you weren't familiar with before? Cause I think that's interesting for me to track as a therapist is like these different parts of ourselves or our relationship to ourselves kind of shifting throughout this time. Well, I think, I realize I'm far more of an extrovert than I realized, that I uh, need other people much more than I anticipated. And uh, I think the longer that we are locked down this way, I think more people are going to sort of get to know themselves a little bit better. Um, I really feel um, very fortunate that I do have the ability to connect with people and you know, make these calls and I have people to call and people to see online, which is really um, a very big bonus. And um, I'm so grateful to my friends and family that we can all be connected this way. And we're reaching out to each other constantly and checking on each other constantly. So it doesn't feel as solitary, but it is certainly something to get used to. Yeah, it is. And, and I and I worry and I'm glad that people like yourself are are still reaching out to individuals, because, again, we're going to come out of this with some psychological damage. But I want us to try to prevent it from being like a true collective trauma. And I really think that staying connected is what's going to help us with that. Exactly. And there is some fun in kind of trauma bonding. I do love to trauma bond. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a lot of uh, collective joy in that. And you know, there's a funny thing of like our drive to go to something that is um, a little bit lighter, but everybody's fascinated with like the Tiger King, you know, that we could all look to something in pop culture and really get obsessed with it. And that I think is a part of trauma bonding that makes it really fun. Oh, I've never heard someone make uh, trauma bonding so glamorous. <laughs> it's really glamorous. <laughs> well done, Margaret. So do you also see this impacting your work? Are, are, you, are you still writing jokes and thinking comedically, or does that get backseated right now? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, there's so much to write about. And, and I have another added bonus in that I need to talk a lot about being Asian American throughout this because I think all of us are looking – for some kind of a scapegoat. And unfortunately, what's happening is that people are looking to Asian Americans as if we've caused this. We are just as much victims as everybody else. This is not the fault of Asian people. I mean, it's not, it's not right to lash out, but it, in a sense, that's the kind of frustration that people have is that they wanna blame somebody. And in, 
in a sense, it is a lot like the Islamophobia that happened after 9-11. Um, it's, it's this thing of like needing to lash out because we're in pain. And so those kinds of things, you know, I think are really important to talk about, to write about. Um, so that's something that will, uh, definitely have a place in my work, but just the, the practical nature of going out and doing comedy, it's, it's not possible. I, I have been doing some shows on lot, like online, um, which is another fun, different way to explore that. So hopefully I'll do more of that. Yeah, thank you for calling out the racism. I think that's been really heartbreaking to see is watching that be how some people are trying to handle their anger and frustration. So thank you for pointing that piece out. Yes, it's really frightening. And it also reminds me of uh, when we were in the middle of AIDS. And this entire, entire thing is like, I, I've noticed with a lot of my gay friends between the ages of 50 and 70, we all really can identify like this is very similar to the beginning of understanding what AIDS was doing to our community. And so we are resilient. We have the ability to rise above a plague and to survive it. And I know this firsthand because I've been through it. I've been through it with a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of people. And so, you know, we, we've we done this before. We can do it again. We can overcome this. Beautiful resilience. But we do so by banding together, right? Not by othering. Exactly. And that's so important. So it's a valuable time for us to just really band together and be united through this. Margaret Cho, we have some tweets. Uh, I'd love for you to answer with us. One of them came in specifically for you. Uh, for, those that okay. want to join, for those that want to join the conversation, you can do so by sending your questions to our Loveline IG page or by tweeting at the hashtag I'm listening. We'll be answering the questions throughout the show. This question asks, hey, Margaret, I'm so thankful for comedy right now. What is your perspective on the need for humor and comedy at a depressing time like this? We really need to laugh. Laughter is such a balm. It's such a healing thing. And um, to be able to laugh is really to be able to breathe and to breathe through it. It's almost, um, it's a very life-giving thing to be able to have laughter and to laugh about something. If you're laughing about something, then it means that you're dealing with the pain of it and uh able to handle it and so humor now is vitally important yeah i mean there's so many great memes coming out of this and there's moments where i want to repost them and part of me is like all right i'm, I'm taking this seriously this is a real thing but also yeah we need moments away so our nervous system can relax we can still find some joy that exists in the world so like thank god for some of those memes right i know i love the memes and i love i love that it, it's like because right now i know that i'm 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 definitely connecting with a lot of people out there who are addicted to manicures and pedicures because this is the time this week. It's the week where God. we really need them. Yeah. And so it's really it's it's really terrifying to deal with your own calluses and to really know the extent of how hard that skin really is. Wow. So we're resilient, <laughs> maybe a little too resilient in some areas. Thank you for that. As I sit here thinking about my dry skin patches. <laughs> I know just it's, it's only downhill from here. I mean, really like I, cause I was living on, through this quarantine. Everything was fine until I realized that I was missing my manicure and pedicure that I have usually about this. I don't do it all that much. It's about once a month, but I need it at that time. And so <laughs> Learning how to do your nails yourself, it's going to be a struggle. Hang in there, Margaret. It'll, it'll, it'll be okay soon. Hang in. Uh, we have I another question. So. Uh, this one asks, every time I watch the news and I see the numbers rise with COVID illnesses and deaths, my heart beats faster and I start to feel panicked. I know I should be watching the news to get updates, but I feel like I'm headed down a slippery slope by using alcohol to cope. Any of your tips would be appreciated with dealing with these anxious and scary times. So, you know, I keep seeing a lot of people talking about a lot of alcohol use starting their morning with alcohol, pouring booze into, you know, their cereal. I mean, there's a whole lot going on in the alcohol world. How, how would you recommend people tackling that? Well, I am fortunate enough to not have that in my life. And I know the pain of that because I am a recovering alcoholic and drug addict. And certainly there's um, a real desire to want to escape this. But unfortunately, it's it only adds problems. You know, I think that people who can drink and can do that, you know, go ahead, do, do you, do you have fun. 
Um, I don't really have that ability, but I know that uh, it's something that, like, when you're out of the, the, you know, out of the alcohol haze, then all you have is a headache and you still have all the same problems. And then people who are um, compromised in that, you know, you may have addictive tendencies anyway, this kind of a quarantine can really push you into a dark place. And alcohol is a depressant and it can make you feel worse than you might feel without it. So I think that it's really every everybody's choice. But for me, I, I really am consciously trying to not medicate um, my emotions because it doesn't, for me, it doesn't stop there. It goes into a very dark place. And and, and really to limit your uh, intake of the news, maybe, I mean, maybe a couple of times a day to check in. Uh, th- just watching it constantly is going to make you have anxiety. It makes everybody have anxiety. But um, as long as you're doing what you can to be socially distant, uh, to be safe, washing your hands, you shouldn't be worried about it. Yeah, I like the, I like the use of the word consciousness that you said because I think on one hand I'm telling people now more than ever like we have to be a little easier and letting go on our coping mechanisms, eat eat those extra cookies, sleep in a little bit more, but also not abusing ourselves with our coping mechanisms because then it's not a coping mechanism like we're supposed to walk away feeling soothed by them. Yes, yeah. self-soothing and self-care is vitally important, but you know, when it delves into uh, addiction, maybe some, some some difficulties that you maybe didn't even know you might have had. I mean, I, I think that anything like this that's going on will drive anybody to want to escape somehow. But uh, I mean, I, I don't know. I think um, it, it's up to the person, obviously. But for me, those kinds of methods of self-care only backfire, unfortunately. Margaret Cho, thank you, so, thank you so much for joining us, sending a lot of love and support to you in this time. Thank you. Have a great night. All right, you are watching I'm Listening, Stay Connected. I'm Listening is a 24-7, 365 initiative, and we're working really hard on destigmatizing, talking about mental health. Because again, right now more than ever, we need to get comfortable feeling our feelings, expressing them to those around us, and also creating a safe space for those around us to express their emotions towards us. That's how we're going to get through this time. So we're talking a lot about different coping mechanisms, going easier on ourselves, but at the same time not really harming ourselves in some of the ways that we're trying to practice our self-care. If you want to send a question to us, you can do so by sending it to our Loveline IG page or by tweeting it at hashtag I'm listening. This question asks, I have my first ever therapy appointment today. I'm nervous, not just because therapy is scary and vulnerable, but because I suffer from certain traumas and I want to know if it matters or not to have a therapist who specializes in specific trauma or if all therapists should be able to help. I like this question. I want people to take advantage of the fact that therapists are still able to practice therapy via teletherapy or through Skype and different other services. So if you do feel like you need added support, please, now more than ever, take the time to reach out. A lot of therapists are offering sliding scale fees as well. But to answer your question, a standard therapist would be trained in a well-rounded way that they should be able to help you with your trauma work. And any ethical therapist, if they realize that the work is outside what we call the scope of their education or understanding, they would refer you out. So I trust that you're going to be in good hands. And I really applaud you for taking the time now to really focus on working on your mental health with some support of the therapist. You know, that that's why I'm thankful I'm able, I'm able to be available to my clients as well. Because again, right now what's happening is for many of us a little bit bigger than what we have the internal resources to cope with on our own. So do not feel bad about reaching out to family members, loved ones, or also a therapist. Now we're going to be joined by Dr. Jen Wider, our medical health expert. Dr. Jen, how are you? Hi, Dr. Chris. How are you? I'm doing all right. I'm practicing everything I'm preaching, so I'm thriving. (laughs) I'm practicing what you're preaching too. (laughs) You look great, so you're thriving as well. So thriving. let's jump into some stuff. Uh, you know, I'm watching the news as is everyone, and they're talk- talking a lot now more so than ever about people being asymptomatic, aka they are infected with the virus, but they're not aware yes. of it. Talk to us about that. Okay. So, you know, there have been a multi- multitude of, of reports um, about how asymptomatic people can actually be driving this pandemic. And if you're asymptomatic, that means that you're not showing any symptoms of the disease. Uh Unfortunately, Chris, I think, you know, there have been some estimates in the past when we first started to see a breakout, especially on the east coast of this country, uh, they were looking at the statistics out of Wuhan province, obviously, in China, 
And one of the epidemiologists at Columbia University Medical Center thought that this, this pandemic in the United States was being driven 86% by asymptomatic patients or people, which means that people that weren't showing any symptoms could unknowingly pass along this disease. I think the number is probably high because I looked at other estimates and statisticians and other epidemiologists, so that number looks a bit high. But absolutely, people that are not showing symptoms, people that may be pre-symptomatic, which means that they don't yet have symptoms but will be coming down with symptoms, or those that are asymptomatic that really have mild disease uh, that isn't gonna turn into much but will still test positive for corona, will be able to pass along those symptoms, which which is which is making it very difficult to track, um, which is why we really need an antibody test in this country. Hopefully, we'll see that soon, which will tell us, you know, basically how widespread this disease is right, right now. And that's why I'm thankful to see a lot of state legislators, governors, mayors telling us to wear the masks now because we right. might be symptomatic and passing along without realizing it. So we're wearing them to protect others. I also saw that there's a city in Texas that might start fining people for being in public without wearing the mask. Right. And, you know, there's a lot of confusion surrounding the mask right now, and I just want to address that also. So what they're recommending, you know, originally when they put out these recommendations, they wanted people to stop hoarding the N95 masks that are par and parcel so important for our frontline healthcare workers, right? So that N95 mask is the respirator mask. It lets in, you know, less than 5% of viral particulate matter. It's supposed to protect you against coronavirus. And that really is needed by people in the emergency departments, doctors and nurses in the ICUs that are coming face to face with patients. It's not really needed by the average person in this country. And unfortunately, we've seen people buy those masks up in very large numbers. And we're seeing, which I think is one of the more tragic parts of this, our healthcare providers not being fully protected. Having said that, a lot of infectious disease specialists are now talking about widespread wearing of masks, whether they're surgical masks or whether they're homemade masks. The mask itself would not be able to protect the average person if you were to walk into a healthcare center and work with patients or volunteer, for example, which none of us are gonna do. But if you go to a grocery store and you're doing shopping like the average citizen would do, and you pick up something that may, have, may be infected, that mask will actually stop you from touching your face, which is why those masks are so important. They offer some degree of protection, and it's probably wise for people to be putting those masks on at this point, and, and it's confusing with what the FDA is recommending or not, but it's, it's important to err on the side of caution. When it comes to cloth masks for healthcare providers, those masks aren't gonna help people that are face-to-face -face with coronavirus patients, because unfortunately they won't have a respirator component and the viral particle could get stuck on a cloth mask and make a healthcare provider more at risk. Um, but for the average person, yeah, I think we're going to see those recommendations more in the weeks to come. Okay, beautiful. And talk to us about the concept of peak. I, I just was hearing yes. that they're saying we haven't reached peak yet, which is really heartbreaking to hear when I'm looking at the numbers. I think we yes. hit the highest rate of deaths yet um, in this country that we've had, and we haven't even yeah. reached the peak. So what are we looking at ahead of us? Absolutely. You know, here's another good way to look at this. The cities around the United States are not experiencing this crush of patients the same way other cities are in chron chronologic order. So for example, if we, we look at New York City right now, the ICUs and the emergency departments are stretched to their capacity. And that, that's why we see areas like the Javits Center or Central Park, or even that naval ship that came in to try to release some of that load on the hospitals at this point. When, when New York City peaks, which will probably be a little bit earlier than some of these other cities that are getting hit a little bit later, that case of person infected and mortality will hit an all time high. And then the next subsequent days will start to come down. And that's that will be what we define as the peak. But the peak in New York City is going to look different than the peak in like a Detroit or a Miami or a Louisiana, New Orleans, um, because we're affected at a different timeline. But uh, you're right. I mean, some of this news is so heartbreaking seeing the number of deaths uh, what we need to remember is it's it, part of the reason is a lot of these these cases are spiking with people that were infected before some of these social distancing measures were put in place. And that's why as a public, we need to remind ourselves social distancing will work and these numbers are going to start to slow like that curve that we mentioned, flatten the curve, where hopefully people can learn from what happened in New York City so their cities don't replicate what's going on in the East Coast. Because these hospitals, again, Chris, are just getting slammed 
we're hoping that other cities can take the precautions ahead of time so that their healthcare systems can function properly. I'm hoping because it, it literally Me breaks too. my heart to see these numbers uh, on the Horrendous. rise. Horrendous. Uh, Dr. White, we have a question I'd love you to answer with us. This question sure. asks, I recently started to get chest pains along with bad palpitations, which causes me to feel anxious at night. Does COVID symptoms include chest pains? So again, there's a lot of these questions about symptomology. So talk to us about the uh, evidence around chest pains. Right. Okay. So here, here's, you know, here's the other thing, you know, when we typically heard about this disease come onto the forefront, especially in the media, we were reporting typical symptoms like shortness of breath, fever, sore throat, and cough. Uh, what we've seen in the wide variety of patients that have been affected in this country, there are a multitude of different symptoms. We originally heard, you know, loss of smell, loss of taste. That was one of those hallmark symptoms. In addition to people that may have GI symptoms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, um, chest pain, you know, uh, unfortunately for some patients, there are people that are experiencing chest pain. Now, having said that, some of the other symptoms that I mentioned, like shortness of breath, may be due to anxiety and chest pain also can be one of those symptoms that can be due to a variety of different causes. Some people with coronavirus get chest pain or back pain because the lining of the lung gets inflamed and that's something called pleurisy or pleuritis and they can experience lower back pain or even chest pain from that, Chris. But usually it isn't one of the only symptoms that you experience. Most people that are experiencing chest pain will get a hallmark of the other symptoms. It usually isn't that first red flag symptom it usually comes along with a fever, shortness of breath, and some other respiratory symptoms. So for people getting you know, a bit of tachycardia, which is just the heart racing a bit, or you feel like your heart's skipping a beat, and the chest pain is there a little bit, you, know, you, you want to absolutely check in with your doctor. I recommend that, just as you said, with mental health care providers. Take advantage of those telemedicine uh, you know, like resources right now. They're tremendous. Get in touch with your doctor, see what they think, but they'll look at a hallmark of other symptoms before they you know, view you as someone at risk for corona. Okay, beautiful. And here's another question I'd love you to answer with us. This question asks, my mom wants to see me for my birthday, but since I have oh. to be around people a lot for work, I don't want to risk getting her sick in case I'm carrying the virus unknowingly. How can I help her better understand this? Yeah, I have a sigh every time I hear this. People are trying to find a lot of loopholes and gray areas that somehow give them permission to travel and be around others. Yes. But I'm sure you agree with me that the answer always has to be a flat out no way not going to happen. Yes, and, and I've heard this and I've gotten questions from people, you know, a lot about this actually. And I think, you know, one thing that we have to remember is even though we're seeing a lot of cases in the news of people that are younger getting affected by this, the group that really is at higher risk remains our older population, grandparent age, people above the age of 65, those with underlying conditions. You know, I'm not sure what this person is doing at work if it's not an essential practice of business. We really need to come together as a nation and try to use telecommuting and e, you know, e-services to work with these non-essential businesses. I really believe in that wholeheartedly to watch this curve flatten, but absolutely not. She should not visit her mother. Um, and unfortunately, some of, you know, some of the older Americans are a little bullish when it comes to this. I've dealt with this with some older relatives as well. Uh, you know, they feel like they've been through more than the younger generation and they too can get through this, but you know, they're, they're susceptible. So yeah, social distancing is incredibly important. It's a great time to get on, do like a zoom video birthday or make a video montage, even drive by the house. If they're local with signs is, is, is much better than getting together because they're really putting their, their parent at risk and uh, it's just not worth it. And it's not forever. Like I keep trying to remind people, yes. stop with the the you know verbal gymnastics of finding loopholes and reasons and ways, stay the heck right. home. And it's not forever. Like next birthday, next what a holiday, we'll all yes. be together, but let this one pass. Um, I also have a question around antibody tests because that's something I'm hearing more people talking about yes. as well. Yeah, so Chris, so right now what we have is a test that is basically designed to test fragments of viral genes in our, in our nasal cavity, right? So people that have gone in for a coronavirus test have had a nasal swab go up into their nasal cavity. It really needs to be quite uncomfortable for it to be a good test. A lot of people are complaining about the pain of this test. It's very quick, but it's a deep nasal swab and it takes out viral material and then they examine it. They blow it up and examine the genetics of that. An antibody test is something that looks a little different. It's a finger prick test, and it's obviously blood for that reason, and it will test antibodies in our bloodstream to see who has been affected by this disease. This test is part of how we're gonna see the end of being socially isolated. What's gonna happen is we need a widespread testing with this antibody test, which is definitely coming, Chris. It's 
you know, it's in production. There are different groups racing to put this out for general populations. The, uh, the UK and England, they just ordered 3.5 million of these tests. Everyone will hopefully get tested eventually to see who ha is producing antibodies. And what that's going to tell us, Chris, is one, do we have immunity to this? And how widespread is this problem? And as like uh, public health officials will tell you, this is the only way to really get a handle on this. So that's very exciting. The FDA just, uh, just actually today, Chris, just approved the test for the United States. So hopefully we'll see that rolling out in the next couple of weeks. Beautiful. Dr. Jen Wider, as always, thank you so much for being a part of our show. Thanks so much, Dr. Chris. Have a great Chris. night. You too. All right. I'm listening. Stay connected. If you want to join the conversation, you can do so by tweeting at hashtag I'm listening or by sliding your message into the DMs on Loveline's IG page. I have a question right here. This one asks, how do I combat the loneliness of living alone? This feels brutal. My heart goes out to you. There's a lot of us that are not self-isolating with family members, loved ones, other individuals. Um, we have to do the best we can. Again, this isn't forever. I want you to focus on your mental health. That's going to be one of the most important and imperative priorities you have. So that means following all the tips we've been giving all along, which is getting fresh air, going outside, taking a break from the news, but again, staying connected to loved ones and individuals. I'm so thankful for all the apps, the games, technology. Um, every day I'm hearing about a new game, a new app, a new form of technology and a way to connect. So make use of those. Keep reminding yourself though, as a way to decrease some of the anxiety that this isn't forever. This is not the new normal. This is just for right now. So deal with it the best you can. Again, if you need to reach out and get some therapy, at the end of the show here, we'll be leaving you with some resources, but um, stay connected and, and hang tough. We're all in it with you. Um, on our next show, we're going to be having actor Stephen Glickman and also internet and life coach Michael Buckley and uh, answering all your questions. So do so by hashtagging I'm listening or sliding into our Loveline IG page. As always, thanks for hanging out with us and you all have an awesome, awesome night.